Yeah, man. Nation, what it do? Hey, hop to all my knockers all across the plane. Digging on 432, the drop radio. Man, everyone digging in, enjoying what we are featuring and things we are, you know, looking into. The investigation, a hop to the entire ether squad. All my knockers from the very tip top up into the present. Hey, we all are one drop, and you know, it's been one drop. One wave, my noggin, you know, and I appreciate all my dragons on the wall, all the supporters, all the cons, keeping the water flowing for the entire Ether Squad, man. And all my contributors, you know, building for Nagaville, for Joy World, for the fence, you know, all the great drop merchant purchasing, all the packs, my noggin. Hey, up to you. We back in Kalelu. And I'm back on a familiar publication. Hey, how to Aqua Tabeza? Hey, man, uh, this is that Arizona State Museum, and I just wanted to revisit some of these bodies on bodies. Uh, the supernatural, man. We got to do a remix, man. We got to do a bodies on bodies remix, man. Hey, Arizona State Museum, they they drowned them. What do they do with these artifacts? Not just artifacts, we talking bodies on bodies, my nigga. Oh, you think it's play play? You think it's play play? Let me read some of this right here, man. The Arizona State Museum, State Museum, University of Arizona has completed an inventory of human remains and associated funerary objects. In consolation with the appropriate Indian tribes. Well, that will be you, Manak. Because you're going to see when they're dating these things. And uh, ain't no native talking about 
Uh, no recon from 200 AD and 300 AD, my knock. I mean, <laughs> yeah, this, this is that American prehistory, man. You know what I'm saying? So we just talking Nagas and Nagaville. But they're saying that these human remains, all right, in consultation with the appropriate Indian tribes or native Hawaiian organizations. So that's who sort of the gatekeepers around these, these, uh, these bodies on bodies. It has determined that there is a cultural affiliation between the human remains and associated funeral objects and present day Indian tribes. Yeah. Okay. Wait till you see these dates, but not. <laughs> How can they say, Oh yeah, that's my, Great, 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 <laughs> great, 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 great grandmother from 256 AD. Man, stop it, man. They over here gatekeeping our mamas, our abas, right here in Calais Luce. So we're digging on the Hebrew artifacts and I'm digging on the Ibaru, the Hebrew bodies on bodies. Let's put it all together. As you know, we, we, we had to come back to this. Our quad top battle. We had to come back to. It. So let me get this piece again. The Arizona State Museum, University of Arizona, has completed an inventory of human remains and associated funerary objects in consultation with the appropriate Indian tribes or native Hawaiian organizations. And has determined that there is a cultural affiliation between the human remains and them Indians. <laughs> but they had to put present day Indian tribes or native Hawaiian. You already know what Kama Hamaya Kamaya Maya looking like. We gotta get back to King Kamaya Maya, man. Hawaii, Hawaii. Let's go. Organization. So this native Hawaiian organization not identified in this notice that wish to. Oh, let's back it up. It says lineal descendants or representatives of any Indian tribe not identified in this notice that wish to request transfer of control of these human remains and associated funerary objects should submit a written request to the Arizona State Museum, University of Arizona. Uh, so they giving out bodies on bodies in Calais Luce. Just talking Arizona, just talking promised land. Kalelu's means promised land. Get the book Forbidden Histories by David Lowe. How low can they go? They just dishing out bodies on bodies of Nagas that they can't claim. And there must be others that these tribes ain't trying to claim all these bodies because they say, yo, if you are a lineal descendant, or representative of any Indian tribe or native Hawaiian organization not identified in this notice. So, you know, if you don't see your name, but you want to claim your people, <laughs> you wish to request transfer of control of these human remains and associated funerary objects, you should submit a written request to the Arizona State Museum, University of Arizona. If no additional request has come forward, transfer of control of these Nagas of the human remains and associated funerary objects to the lineal descendants, Indian tribes, or native Hawaiian organizations stated and this notice may proceed. So if y'all Nagas don't step up, if no additional requesters come forward, then the transfer of all these Nagas shall or may proceed. So may proceed where? To wherever? I mean, who's really going to claim bodies, right? I mean, 
Ain't no Nagas in the hood gonna claim bodies because they ain't gotta bury these bodies. And that, that's a whole nother funeral cost, right? So, you know, you know how that go. <laughs> I mean, for real, for real. That's how Nagas, you know. <laughs> so, you know, we ain't thinking. You know, it's not like they don't see what they can get out of it, you know. Who could really connect themselves to 200 AD and all this? All we can do is, you know, bring it all together. You know what I'm saying? With with this Nagaville, you know, uh, Copper Color Con, this original con is. And, you know, by the time you get to 200 AD in America, and, yeah, you're talking tribal, you, you, you already know you're talking about the Naga. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we could put that together fairly easy. You know, the land of Preston John and what it's looking like. You in the kingdom. You are in that. You're in the empire, the greatest empire that will always remain as long as the Nagas KTC. So you're going to claim this, man. <laughs> so they just dishing our bodies on bodies to whatever they're calling Indian tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations. Now, it says lineal descendants or representatives of any Indian tribe or Native Hawaiian organization not identified in this notice that wish to request transfer or control of these human remains and associated funerary objects. So, what are all these other objects? You know what I'm saying? Should submit a written request with information in support of the request to the Arizona State Museum. Who can, who today can submit a sufficient request for them? To say, oh, okay, cool. That's the Johnson family. Hey, give him that and all them things, all his stuff. You know, who can identify themselves to a specific body enough to substantiate some claim, man? This is, a, this is, you know what I mean? This is play play. You know, how are they as quote unquote Indian tribes substantiating some claim from 200 AD? Let's get these days, man. Let's go, man. So you see, it's a, you know, they on this play play. You see what's happening. I'm going to read this part right here. It says, notice is here given in accordance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act called the NAGPRA. My NAGPRA, I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> N-A-G-P-R-A. All right. Of the completion of an inventory of human remains and associated funerary objects under the control of the Arizona State Museum, University of Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, the human remains and associated funerary objects were removed from Pima County, Arizona. And we keep hearing this Pima pop up, you know, when we talk about uh, the book Calais Lose, you know what I'm saying, that we've been digging on by Cyclone Covey. This notice is published as part of the National Park Service Administrative Responsibilities under NAGPRA. The determinations in this notice are the sole responsibility of the museum, institution, or federal agency that has control of the Native American human remains and funerary objects. Somebody got your things and somebody got your stuff. So we've been talking about these damn dams. We're going to get back on that. These lakes, investigating these lakes, man. All our Naga, our Naga cities. But then you just got your Naga remains and funerary objects popping up out of Arizona. And they're like, who want them? Who can substantiate a claim? Come on, man. It's 2021. You don't cut a people off from being a nation. It's hard to go back to 200 AD, right? Yeah, man, we just got to put it together. Here's some of the jabronis, you know what I'm saying? Claiming, uh, you know, pieces of this stuff. This is a detailed assessment of the human remains was made by the Arizona State Museum, ASM, professional staff in consultation with representatives of the Ak A K Chin C H I N Indian Community of Maricopa Ak Chin Indian Reservation Arizona. So these Ak Chins are in on something. Uh, the Gila River Indian Community of the Gila River Indian Reservation. They're in on something. 
uh, the Hopi tribe of Arizona, you know, they're in on something. You got the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community of the Salt River Reservation. They may be in on something too. All right, then you got the Tahona o Odom Nation of Arizona and the Zuni tribe of the Zuni Reservation, New Mexico. All might be in on something. <laughs> All right, let's go. History and description of the remains in 1999. Here we go. In 1999 or before, human remains representing at minimum one individual, at minimum one individual were removed from its unknown location in Arizona. But it's unknown. Relito Wash in Pima County, Arizona. Um, I think they try to connect it there. The collection was deposited with ASM, Arizona State Museum, in 1999 by an unknown individual. <laughs> no known individuals were identified. The six associated funerary objects are one main O fragment and five ceramic sherds. The condition of the human remains is consistent with the prehistoric human burial. Prehistoric human burial, like almost like an Egyptian flow, you know what I mean? I don't know. And the nature of the associated objects suggest that the burial may be dated to the ceramic period, approximately A.D. 200. Who's going to connect themselves to 200? Can your genealogy do it for you, man? Or does it get realer when you're swimming in these deep water? You're going to have to have deep roots. <laughs> and it says, uh, some even span up into 1500. So it even gets, you know what I'm saying? What's popping in the 1500s? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It's all happening. That's that, uh, Charles, Charles Quinto, Charles V era, right? So, you got all that cities of gold, all that stuff popping off, right? We're talking Kalelus, my name. So the condition of the human remains is consistent with the prehistoric human burial and the nature of the associated objects suggests that the burial may be dated to the ceramic period, approximately A.D. 200 to 1500. Yeah. In 1938, human remains representing at minimum one individual were, re were removed from an unnamed site. And they're connecting with, with Tonk, T-A-N-Q-U-E, Verde Creek in Pima County. So a lot's popping off in Pima. The human remains were found inadvertently and donated to the Arizona State Museum by G.E.P. Smith. The human remains and a ceramic vessel were brought to the Arizona State Museum and assigned an ascension number. The ceramic vessel is missing. No known individuals were identified. No associated funerary objects are present. This unnamed site is seven miles northeast of Tucson. No northern contextual information is available. No further contextual information is available. Based on ceramic typology, the human remains likely date to the Hohokam cultural period. Now we're talking AD 500, my nigga. So, yeah, man, this is this ain't touching nothing that, you know, your paperwork's able to touch. This is how to, you have to go back to the originals, man. Yeah, ain't, ain't no BCs and all this stuff. All this new chronology. Scaliger, Patavius. <laughs> so, you know, you're going back to the originators. This whole, whole calm cultural period, 8500 to 1450. Interesting how the whole, whole calm period ends. What, two years right before the 15, or excuse me, 1452. Papal Bulldog to take down. Oh, yeah. 
1969 human remains representing at minimum one individual were removed from an unrecorded site. They're saying might be connected to Tucson, Site 17, and Pima County. Arizona, the excavation was conducted by the property owner who donated the human remains to the Arizona State Museum in 1970. No ascension number was assigned. No known individuals were identified. No associated funerary objects were present. The site is on the east side of the Santa Cruz River, Santa Cruz River flood, pet, flood plain in a region with a long history of human occupation. Okay. <laughs> so the site where this night is found is on the east side of the Santa Cruz River flood plain in the region with a long history of human occupation. Long history, my night. <laughs> they didn't just get off no boat, man. Ceramics were reportedly collected at the same time as the human remains, but they have not been found. Based on the reported typology of the ceramics, the human remains likely date to the late Agua Caliente phase of the early ceramic period. Listen up, man. AD 300 to 500. So they narrowed down these human remains, AD 300 to 8500. Now it starts getting real in 1976 and 1978. Human remains representing at minimum 72 individuals were removed from the Hardy site, Pima County. The legally authorized excavations were conducted by the University of Arizona ASM under the, under the direction of Linda Gregonis and Carl Reinhardt as part of a field school. Field school. All right, so they found 72 Nagas between 1976 and 1978. Arizona State Museum's all up in this, man. University of Arizona is all up in this Naga, you know, Naga bodies on bodies. You know, we say we Ibaru, we Hebrew, they say, where's the bodies? They're hiding the bodies, they're destroying the bodies, they're, they're you know what I'm saying, dishing them off to these tribes as if it's them, right? As if they connected the mound builders, right? Car. As if it's their stuff that's underneath them lakes, man. It's Nagaville. Don't get mad now that we claim Nagaville. Because Nagas build in Nagaville. Nagas home now, see? Don't get mad now. Ain't nothing to see here, boss. Just Nagas going Naga. Naga bodies. Where's the bodies? 72 individuals dated between 750 and 900. Who can give me some history before 700 in America? Go. I don't talk about no so-called white man, no Roman uh, and his ship, you know, lost. Nah, man. If you're talking Remani. Then you're talking the pomegranate, the pomegranate, granada nagas right here, already in the promised land. Cut lay loose. Give me some history before before 500 A.D. in America. Go. 300, go. 100, go. Yeah, man. It's a blind spot, right? It's a blind spot. All you got is assumptions in your head, Paul. If today's natives can't claim the mounds, you know. These mysterious places, these mysterious treasures of Moctezuma, no one can 
No one could touch this stuff, right? No one could come close to these sacred places. And then you got a sacred people that think they from Af think they got off a boat from Africa. Hey, out to all my Africans, but we didn't just get off no boat from Africa. And you know that. And we know that. So we good. Now we can vibe up. Now we can help each other. But, you know, there was a bit of an identity crisis. So we just getting to be us again. Get out of our way. Let us be us. Because ain't nobody helped us up. So you might as well back back. Give us 50 feet. Ain't nobody came over here to save us. Didn't cause no war to help us from this ass whooping we had to endure. I don't want to hear it now that we figuring stuff out. You didn't help us for the ass whooping. You ain't helping us right now. Unless we all see clearly together. But to do that, we got to see clearly together. You know what I'm saying? We, we got to try, but we got to look at these bodies, man. At the end of the excavations, the archaeological collections were brought to the Arizona State Museum and assigned an ascension number. No, no individuals were identified, of course, because it's you, my noggin. If it was them, they would be identifying these, <laughs> these folks all over the place. The six associated funerary objects are at one bone all, A-W-L, one bone tool, one ceramic disc, one ceramic figurine, one ceramic jar, and one lot of mineral fragments. So they call this the Hardy site. The Hardy site is a multi-component site with occupations in the historical period associated with Fort Lowell, as well as prehistoric components from the early ceramic and Hohokam cultural periods. You know, when we talk Hohokam, it means those that have disappeared, connected with the Anasazi migrations, love to the Hakan. You know, connected with the Magellan flow, connected with the Rota flow, the real Rota, the kingdom. Israelites, Ibaru artifacts. And that's why we've, you know, been digging on these artifacts first, you know, and then Aquatai, you know, brought this out, man, with his bodies on bodies in the same place, man, and giving you very similar dates that they were dating all these Hebrew artifacts, 700s, 600s, 500s. Now, it don't take no rocket scientist to start matching up these bodies on bodies with these artifacts, these Hebrew artifacts. And they want to make them some white Romans, you know, and in all this uh, history now, it gets stolen again, right? We don't have no error, you know, like there, there, there's no room for error when you have the kingdom of Solomon popping off. Sylvanus so told Texas popping off. Theodore Roos popping off, these great, you know, battles popping off, Israel on Israel, in the 700s, ain't no place for no white kingdom, man. These are Nagas. Ain't no place for it. You got Sylvanus Bravo already popping off, Lane Calvo, Lancelot popping off, Tapu Zin. Popping off Israel the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. You got um, Kitsukoodo popping off. Joshua, all this is happening, leading up to the Moshe flow, which looks like you know, on their timeline, it's happening like in the you know, eight hundred A.D., nine hundred. I mean, all this is happening around the same time, leading up into the Kandawi flow. You know, popping off around like that 1,000 mark, 1,100 mark, up into the 1,200 mark. I mean, that's just on they, you know, situation, you know, that we can start fitting these things in. Because after that, you got Columbus popping up 200 years later in the 1400s, right? So, ain't no room for air, ain't no room for that type of air, man. You can't have your little white kingdom popping off in America no more. Not in the 700s. 
<laughs> they say, oh, these Jewish artifacts must belong to us. And then they hit it. First, they claimed it. You know, it was in the New York Times in the 20s. They have a whole article about these Kalelu's artifacts, Hebrew artifacts found in America in the 20s. And then they buried this stuff, right? They don't want to talk about it no more. Because they realize if we claim to be them, we got to claim to be the people that got rolled up on by Columbus. If we claim to be these Hebrews in America <laughs> that connect to Quetzalcoatl directly, you know what I'm saying? Then we got to claim heritage of Quetzalcoatl. We got to claim to be these natives, man. <laughs> and how would that go today if the so-called Jews claim to be natives today? Come on, man. So... You know, it got real iffy. They knew they couldn't walk in them shoes. They hid this stuff. But nobody could walk in our shoes. But nugget, that's what you're really seeing. It's a big, vacant piece of history. They got swords coming out of Arizona. Swords, man. All these biblical wars, they had swords. David and them. Moses had swords. He's king of Cush for 40 years in the book of Jasher. Come on, man. Swords with Hebrew on them, swords with these diplodocuses or dragons on them, man. Same time period, man. that's all I'm saying. So now you're finding 72 individuals at the Hardy site. And then 1931 and 1940 and 2010 and 2013, so they're still finding Nagas. They found human remains representing at minimum... 44 Nagas. <laughs> they said 44 individuals were removed from the University Indian Ruin, Arizona. At least, at minimum, individuals, right? Individuals are not describing these people for a reason. If it was they people, 44 white, white, white men were <laughs> white men bodies with white, white women. I mean, they'd be going crazy. If it was natives, they'll be talking, oh, it's clearly natives. They ain't saying nothing, right? Oh, they're not identifiable. Legally authorized excavations were conducted by the University of Arizona, Arizona State Museum in the years 1931 to 1939. Pay attention because G.E. Kincaid is popping off in Arizona, too, with the Grand Canyon, finding Egyptian stuff in there, all that. You know what I'm saying? Ibaru, everything's flowing through there. In the 30s as well. So in the 30s, a lot's happening from the Grand Canyon that's really overshadowing this Kalelu's excavation, man. That's overshadowing all these excavations popping up that they're calling legal. It's just legal to come, invade a country, invade a land, and start digging up their bodies. That's, that's legal, authorized. Oh, now we're back to the Doom Diverses. 1452 Papa Boo. Authorizing King Alfonso. King Alfonso authorizing everybody to legally invade, seek, or search out, capture, vanquish all you Sarah's sons, huh? All you Nagas, all you Negroes, everywhere you are. And it wasn't a white or Negro thing, it was a Negro or Negro thing. Who's behind that papal bull? I guarantee they look just like you. I guarantee they look just like you. We ain't on that play play. We aware, my not. We got the 360 Dragon Flitter perspective. Along with these 44 Nagas, they found 63 funeral, funerary objects. You know, from different ceramics, jars, shirts, vessels, chip stones, pendants, shell beads, some more, uh, and two stone artifacts. I wonder what that is. Right? Let's call them stone artifacts. Man. So those Nagas are dating to 1100 to 1450. Man. So I'm just scrolling down. You got 33 Nagas 
removed from the Honey Bee Village site. All this in Arizona. It's called the Honey Bee Village site. We got a Naga found at the Collier Creek Slide site in Arizona. You know, dated to 450. Okay. Got another Naga found at the La Paloma site in Pima County, Arizona. They're putting his date 302 or her date 302 to 625. It's all happening. <laughs> it's all happening, man. So, you know, let me just get to a little bit on the conclusion that they wrote. And then I want to get a dismount, man. Love to Aqua Tie with a brand new book. Aqua Slid to a Naga. I got to, you know, I got to at least start with the intro. You know, familiar author, Gene, uh, is it Hancock? We're talking Kyber, we're talking Kiber, Kavera. We're talking Kavera, my Naga, then, you know. You know, we must be talking Anion. Uh, and we're talking Anion, uh, we gotta be talking Kalebu. So, see how it all ties in. Uh, 1927, another 11 Nagas taken from the Tonk Verde Ruin. Man, dated 1150 to 1300. And they finding bodies on bodies. Bodies on bodies in Kalelus. Akis on Akis, the Amaru. We're talking Sylvanus to Texas. Genealogy never connects this. Just reading some of the of the, what is it called? The determinations. Determinations made by the Arizona State Museum. So these are their determinations. Officials of the Arizona State Museum have determined that pursuant to Title 25 USC 3001, the human remains described in this notice represent the physical remains of 292 Nagas, <laughs> individuals of Native American ancestry, Nagas, that's nearly 300 Nagas right there. Where's the bodies? Bodies on bodies. 292 Nagas that they're trying to just, you know, dish out amongst them, <laughs> amongst each other. And, and a lot that no one's claiming it. Come on, man. No one's claiming it. Because they can't claim it. They also said it. Uh, 1,914 objects. They found almost 2,000 objects right here in Pima County, Arizona. Damn. Where's your things, man? Where's your stuff? It's, don't don't let them trick you to sleep thinking it's all ceramics, man. They say that, so you say, oh, it's just ceramic pottery. They ain't going to tell you that they found, you know what I mean? <laughs> They're going to find the off spark that the Transformers are looking for, man. <laughs> so 1,914 objects described in this notice are reasonably believed to have been placed with or near, with or near individual human remains at the time of death or later as a part of the death rite or ceremony. Yeah. And they ask again, they said, man, any descendants of any of any Indian tribe, you know, that want to request transfer of control of these human remains and associated funerary objects, should submit a written request. All right, so again, they already got their uh, go along, get along, gang. A hop to Kwame. So, you know, I don't know how far they're going to let any, you know, random groups, you know, uh, request, but how would you even know who to request and what to request? You don't know, you know what I mean? So they know that's a far fetched thing. They just got to say it, man. They just got to say it. 
and look into this Nag Nagpra program. N A G P R A program, man. And you know, let it you know. See what we got on that, man. Might be a hard hit. Might be a hard hit, man. We're just surfing the wave. Let's get a little bit of this book, man. Let's fall back. Aqua Tai got a designer. Lawa. Oh, yeah. You know, the other book was called When India Ruled the America, man. And, um, you know, I took great offense to that. I didn't appreciate little India saying that they ruled India, big dragon India superior. But, you know, maybe they don't know no better. Maybe they do. They try to love us to sleep. So we can't have none. <laughs> You, you try to claim Africa, they say, no, you ain't African, man. You try to claim America, they say, oh, no, you ain't Indian enough. <laughs> then you finally say, nah, yes, I am. They say, yeah, but little India once ruled big India. It's all these doors we got to break through in this investigation. So the other book, you know, I couldn't really, I got through some of it, but I was getting so, you know, so charged up. I just had to put it down for a couple couple weeks, you know, turned out to be a couple months. Man, I'm going to pick it back up, though. Same author, so expect me to, you know, possibly have a few things to say. But I'm going to try to just read it from a wave surface. <laughs> Stay out the way and let you put it together. But obviously, they're going to be hijacking sometime. But it's called From Kyber or Kyber. Remember, they spell the Kyber K-H-Y-B-E-R. And I say, man, it reminds me of cyber, right? But they turn, you know, that K to a C. One letter rule. Uh, Horace Butler told us to drop. So Kyber is Kyber, right? You drop that K, you're at the Heber which is connecting you to Eber or the Hebrew. So it's from Kyber Kiber Pass to Grand Kavera or Kivera. The Kivera is still the Kibera. Kiber is Kiver. So whether it's Kivera with a Q, they spell it Q-U-I-V-I-R-A or Kivera with a K-H-E-E V-I-R-A is also Kheber, K-H-E-E-B-E-R, which is Kyber or Kheber, K-H-Y-B-E-R. So these are just, you know, these fun tricks. They like, to, you know, just language, language magic, man, that they did to get us deeper in sleep that we can now connect and say, oh, Kyber, I see Heber, I see Eber, I see Eberu, I see the Hebrew. I see the great Khan Eber, who they would call Kiber or Kiber. And the Kiber, you know, might also connect to this Cabal or Kibal or Chief Cabal, K-A-B-A-L, or the Cabal, <laughs> the secret knowledge, right? But you're talking about really you, secret knowledge of yourself, you know what I mean? Um, which also connects to Cuba, Cuba, <laughs> Cuba, so. Kiber is also Kuba. Crazy, right? Crazy talk. But they connected to this Phoenician Naga. They call him a ancient Phoenician Naga. So you know we're talking the Hebrew. You know we're talking Eber and the Eber root. So that's our backstory. That's our truth. <laughs> As we surf the wave and dodge the hijacks, man. So let's get a little uh, little taste of this for the dismount. Let the aqua tie back. Zani, keeping the Zani. All right, all right. Okay, whoa. I just saw these artifacts popping up, man. They got some good little pictures in here. I'm going right in. I'm going right in, y'all.
Alright, well. I keep accidentally belly flopping in chapter two, so why don't we just pick it up? <laughs> We're gonna pick it up right here. Belly flopping it in chapter two. And maybe next time we'll get chapter one. Let's see what we got here. Chapter two is called Exploring Southwest USA Greatest Mystery, La Gran Cavera. Q U I V I R A. Right, let's get a piece for the dismount. Most people in the American Southwest, from Nebraska to Kansas and Oklahoma, down to Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, and even northwestern Mexico, have heard of the mysterious nation that inspired the gold-starved Spanish conquistadors to march to what is now Southwest USA. In search of the fabled golden empire of Cavera or Evera or Eber or Kiber, Kyber, let's go. And the seven cities of Cibola. Oh. So we put together already, right, from the Forbidden Histories of America by Daniel Lowe, that Cibola, spelled uh, C I B O L A. Cibola is also Shimbala. Shabala is also Cibola. And both those are also Kalelus. Kalelus is Cibola. Um, and that was mentioned a couple of times in a couple of different chapters in the book by Daniel Lowe, Forbidden Histories. Now, Cibola is Kalelus, which also means promised land. And you're talking the seven cities of the promised land. Which is why they're talking seven cities of gold. Which is why on your ancient maps it says Septimania. Sept means seven. Like oct means eight. My naga. So Septimania is referring to the seven cities of Cibola. Or the cities of go -o 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 -o. Yeah man. A term that the Spaniards mistook for an Amerindian name for gold. Yeah, okay, they mistook it and went crazy and found a bunch of gold. Stop it. Cibola turned out to be an American Indian word for buffalo. So this is why I get mad at this author. You want to, you know, be pounding a book sometimes because come on, man. If we didn't get our own recon, we could fall for anything. They would, that right there could throw us right off the path, right? We could say, oh, I thought Cibola meant something to do with a promised land. Oh, no, it means... Uh, it's the Amerindian word for buffalo. Now, Daniel Lowe said the word Kalelus, you know, was of a language that they're still trying to decipher. So, you know, to connect the Kalelus with the Cibola, you're connecting something that you can't even decipher. Just to put buffalo on it and say, well, Cibola is just buffalo. Has nothing to do with gold. So you think we're going to fall for that, Mr. Rub. Uh, Gene D. Matlock. I'm already going in on Gene Matlock, man. I can't believe he did that. I'm, I'm belly flopping. I ain't read this yet, man, but belly flopping. I'm on chapter two. <laughs> All right, so this is how they do us, man. All right, let me readjust myself before I go crazy. All right, so. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? We know about the Calif California gold rush, man. We know about all the gold and stuff and all the gold and the gold and the gold. We keep hearing about the gold. Don't say, oh, well, they thought it was gold here. but uh, So what's all that stuff, man? What's all that stuff in, in them forts, man? What's all that stuff uh, in, in, in Queen Elizabeth closet, man? <laughs> they got our granddaddy wallet, but it's just a buffalo, right? Let's go, man. According to the legends, the Quaverians had more gold than the Aztecs and Inca combined. Not only were the mines of the Quavera reputed to be filled with more unpossessed gold than was ever found in all the history of the world, but a mysterious king whom the American Indians in the area believed was Montezuma sent nearly 2,000 men northward their backs bent unloads under loads of gold to hide his treasures in Cavera's many underground chambers and caves. Whoa, I thought Cavera just 
I thought Cibola just meant buffalo. He said, oh, the Spaniards mistook the name for gold. And then in the next paragraph, you're going to tell us about all the mines reputed to be filled with unpossessed gold. And more than what? More unpossessed gold than was ever found in all the history of the world. But Cibola just mean buffalo, not gold. But more gold than was ever found in all the history of the world is connected to this place. Not the other Asia, <laughs> not the other India, not Africa. You talk Montezuma, and you talk Mansa Musa, and you talk all that Timbuktu, when you talk Tibet, you better talk origin right here in India Superior. The makers have to pull the Hyborian war map back out, show you where Timbuktu really is, where Greater Asia really is, where India Superior really is, Monaga. Let's get a little more for the dismount. I'll go crazy. But they're also connecting it to a king, right? Just like Kiver is a person. Kiver is Eber. Eber. Kiber. 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 Managa. Eber. Managa. Eber. They like to put the K's in front of the H's just to turn the he to a key. <laughs> and then turn the hard K to a CH. Turn it to a she. You know what I'm saying? Hey. All praise to Wah, we're seeing clearly. Allah Wah. Allah Wah. So they put all this, you know, oh, they believe this. And da da da. Like, you can't speak on these people. Oh, well, they just believe that. Hey. To, to them, it was real. To you, this is real. But they try to discount somebody saying, well, you know, they just believe that was the case as if you got the truth. You know what I'm saying? That's what I don't like about these authors. Sometimes they always speak like they got the truth, like they ain't investigating, like they knew more than Montezuma. Like they knew more than them, than the Nagas, you know, speaking on Montezuma. They call him a mysterious king. Not only were the mines of Cavera reputed to be filled with more unpossessed gold than was ever found in all the history of the world, but a mysterious king whom the American Indians believed was Montezuma. I mean, what, what are they wrong? Are they wrong? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Come on, man. Sent nearly 2,000 men northward. Their backs bent under loads of gold to hide his treasures in Quivera's many underground chambers and caves. The Montezuma treasure is perhaps the most elusive of all the lost treasures of the West. There are stories of the great Indian tribes of Mexico moving their treasures north for protection shortly after the invasion of the Spanish. So where's it going to be in Utah? Something, man. There's a lot of, you know, little Shows on TV about searching for the Utah gold, Montezuma gold, all different things, man. So, yeah, we're talking cities of gold, man. Cities of gold. The vast Montezuma treasure is said to be hidden somewhere in the north. Hmm. Do you think it is, Monaga? It said its location. Okay, its location is known only in Indian legend and symbols. Its location is known only in the Naga legend and Naga symbols. The location of which are also unknown. <laughs> so we got to find these, this uh, legend and symbols, you know, to know where the location is of our ancestor, Montezuma. You did. <laughs> Nagas about to be on the treasure. <laughs> Rumors had the riches in gold plates. Rumors had the riches in gold plates and ornaments. In the Colorado mountains. Oh, Templar. <laughs> Take the wheel. <laughs> Take the wheel. More specifically, the Sangre de Cristos. 
S-A-N-G-R-E de Cristos. Often the Spanish peaks or the Spanish caves are mentioned in the legend, demonstrating how the Montezuma story is often involved with other legends. Arizona also lays claim to the Montezuma treasure. Arizona think they got it. Maybe they got a piece. Colorado got a piece. <laughs> and it is involved with one of the more other legends, one or more other legends in that state. New Mexico has cause to fix the limits of the legend within its boundaries. Treasure Tales of the Rockies, page 134. The Macacho de Metates or Metates, P I C A C O C H O, Macacho or Machacho de Matates, M E T A T E S. West of Tucson, the turquoise mines in the Silver Bell District and elsewhere were known to the Aztecs as also its mineral wealth. The ruins of the settlements of the ancient miners are still in evidence. The rock carvings near them are of an entirely different character from those found in other parts of Arizona, being for the most part astronomical symbols. And that's out of Treasure Land by J.G. Hildzinger, page 20. Some historians have dared to state that Caveira existed only in the mind of Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, who explored the length of the Caveira as far as what is now Kansas or Kansas. In his book, The Last Conquistador, Juan de Anate, and The Settling of the Far Southwest, authorian, author Historian Mark Simons reveals the ignorance clouding the minds of most modern historians and archaeologists about one of the greatest anomalies in human history, an anomaly that existed not only in the Americas, but in every other part of the world. For the dismount, in the years when the Spanish Spaniards were endeavoring to unlock the secrets of the new Spain or Mexico, Far frontiers, the name Caveira became attached to the remote plains lying northeast of New Mexico and centering upon the modern state of Kansas. Centering upon the modern state of Kansas. The word first occurs in the Chronicles of Coronado Expedition when a Plains Indian encountered at Pecos Pueblo spoke of his native country in the east as a land rich in gold, silver, and fabrics. Somehow from this Communication quite imperfectly rendered, the eager Spanish listeners came up with Quivera as the name of what of that wondrous kingdom. So somehow they say you don't say the eager Spanish listeners came up with Quivera as the name of the wondrous kingdom whose wealth to the ears seem unlimited. So they contribute that not to a person, but to the eager Spanish listeners, man. Come on, Gene Matlock, man. Well, let's go, man. Could we we got some dropping here, man. We, we got some jewels to connect to our investigation. Whether Caveira represented the mangling of some Indian word or Kieber, Eber, or a purely Spanish creation in, <laughs> is difficult to say. One persistent explanation holds that Coronado selected at as the motto or watchword for his exploration, the catchphrase or challenging phrase, Quinn Vivera Sarah, meaning he who lives will see. Author's interpolation, Quinn Vivera Sarah, really means who will live will be. His men shorten that to Quinn Vivera, then to Quiv. <laughs> so they're trying to make it. Make them come up with Caver, you know what I mean? But again, this is um, this is out the book, The Last Conquistador Juan de Anate, and the Settling of the Far South West, from uh, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. So, you know, <laughs> this is what they want to take credit for. So, Caver, Caver, signifying great, yada yada. And then you got Benito Geronimo Fe, Fe, Fegio, 
F-E-I-J-O-O, stated in the Proyecto Filosofia in Espanol, an encyclopedic collection of ideas and accomplishments of mankind. North of New Mexico, there's a nation called Quiver, which all the ge geography books I have seen discussed, there is no doubt of its existence. North of, the, north of New Mexico, there's no doubt of its existence. The popular opinion of the Mexicans is that there is a great empire, which they call a Grand Quivera. They say that not only does it abound in riches, but the people there are very rational and polite. They say that this empire derived from the ruins of the defeated Mexican Mexican Mexi Moshe Empire fleeing there. I don't know what prince of the royal blood of Montezuma. Fezio's statements reveals a common superstition among both Indians and Europeans at the time in history. Supposedly certain Aztecs transported what wealth the Spaniards didn't rest from them to New Mexico and Arizona, Managa. And we just over here talking about Kalelu. Hey, you wakey wakey yet? You claiming your Nagaville yet? Hey, all praise to why we can reach another checkpoint. Digging on it in the ether. Hey, hop to the ether squad. And hey, hop to all drop nation listening in. All across the planet. Keep surfing the wave live at 432 The Drop Radio. Surfing the wave. Shalom. Yeah, man.